Good afternoon. afternoon. I'm glad you all responded quickly. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really delighted to be here today to participate in this conference that is so clearly important and urgent, and I'm looking forward to our conversation this afternoon. So the title of our panel is Reorienting Puerto Rican Scholarship in the Wake of the Crisis. We have a fantastic lineup in our panelists who are raising urgent questions, long-standing questions, and um, issues related to matters of life and death in Puerto Rico. So we're gonna go in the order that people are seated in, and we're gonna start with Sarah Molinari, who is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the CUNY Graduate Center and a visiting researcher at the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. She is currently conducting ethnographic field work on the politics of debt resistance and hurricane recovery with a National Science Foundation grant. She's also one of the co-creators on the Puerto Rico syllabus, hashtag PR syllabus for those of you who haven't seen it, a digital resource for understanding Puerto Rico's intersecting crises. Next, we're gonna have Jose Atiles, who is an adjunct professor of philosophy at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra. He researches the sociology of law, state terrorism, criminalization, colonialism, and critical legal theory in the context of Puerto Rico. He's the author of the 2018 publication, Law in Conflict, Colonialism, Depolitization, and Re Resistance in Puerto Rico by the Universidad de Los Andes Press. Next, we have somebody from here, Marisol Lebron, who is a new professor here at UT Austin. We're lucky to have her here. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latina, Latino Studies. Her research focuses on social inequality, policing, violence, and protest movements in Puerto Rico and its diaspora. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Policing Life and Death, Race, Violence, and Resistance in Puerto Rico, to be published by the University of California Press in 2019. She's also one of the co-creators of the Puerto Rico syllabus. And finally, last but not least, we have Barbara Abadia Resach, who's an adjunct professor of sociology and anthropology at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, a communication scholar and social anthropologist. She's the author of the book, Musicalizando la Raza, la Racia sorry, La Racialización in Puerto Rico a Través de la Música, published in 2018. So each of these panelists are gonna have 15 minutes to speak, and then we're gonna have a conversation together among the panelists, and then we'll open it up for questions to everyone here. So welcome, we're excited to have you here. Thank you for coming and joining us in this conversation, and we'll get started with Sarah. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. And thank you for being here. It's really an honor to present uh, and thank you so much to all the institutions and departments that sponsored this really important two-day symposium and I'm happy, I'm happy to, to be in Austin. I've been conducting ethnographic research on the politics of debt contestation in Puerto Rico since 2016 after two summers of preliminary field work. And after two summers of preliminary fieldwork, I moved to Puerto Rico this February with a grant to conduct one year of research for my dissertation. I've continued to research the movement for a citizen audit of Puerto Rico's debt, which I had been previously researching, but the hurricane presented for me practical, methodological, and political challenges, as well as a new research direction on disaster recoveries, and that's plural, in relation to women's community organizing, memory, abandonment, and apoyo mutuo or mutual aid in a neighborhood in Caguas. This shift has also led to unexpected reflections about what knowledge production and engaged ethnography mean in the wake of disaster and pushed me to think more deeply about how I can orient my work towards public scholarship that contributes to urgent debates beyond the academy. For the rest of the presentation, I'll be discussing some local impacts of uneven and contested recovery through the lens of one Caguas resident's experience with the FEMA Individual Household Assistance Program and its partners like the Departamento de Vivienda or the Housing Department in Puerto Rico 
and Tu Ogad Renase. I'll argue that it's through the articulations between federal and commonwealth forms of disaster aid, elusive chains of private profit, and contested recovery frameworks that we can think about how inequalities work within colonial disaster management and the spaces of resistance that have opened up because of its failures. In the semi-rural neighborhood of Las Carolinas Caguas, where I'm researching and collaborating with the neighborhood Centro de Apoyo Mutuo, or Mutual Aid Center, residents were without water for three months after Maria, without electricity for seven months, and without municipal debris pickup for 80 days. 60 to 70 percent of the community's 2,500 residents are over 55 years old, and one in three households lives below the poverty line. According to the Residents Association, Las Carolinas has lost 20% of its population over the last three to five years. And this is um, a map of Barrio Bayroa and the sector Las Carolinas is, uh, you, you can't see the words, but it's in the southeast section of Bayroa. During the post Maria wait for debris collection, some Las Carolinas residents made a monthly ritual out of acknowledging the debris birthday and decorating the piles lining the streets with Christmas ornaments. Trucks from the privately contracted company EC Waste finally appeared in early December 2017 after the Residents Association president, Miguel Rosario, wrote an op-ed in El Nuevo Día critiquing the mayor and what he called the, quote, absent municipal state, end quote. Among other things, the municipality kept delaying debris pickup, barely circulated information, and originally scheduled Las Carolinas last among all sectors in the municipality for power restoration. These are two of, of Miguel's, Miguel's tweets during, um, during last year. And this is a picture one resident sent me of the, the Christmas decorations on top of the debris in the neighborhood. The municipality of Caguas has selectively cut back on maintenance with a 14% total budget cut from 2016 to 2018 exacerbated by a $350 million cut from the central government's contributions to all municipalities in fiscal year 2017 to 2018. And these are budgets, of course, that have been uh, approved by the Junta de Control Fiscal. Beyond the selective austerity and uneven effects of Maria, disaster assistance and recovery measures themselves may exacerbate vulnerability and inequality over time. These contradictions have also shaped alternative ways of imagining recovery through mutual support rather than individualizing and market-driven frameworks meant to restore private property, wealth, and the existing social order. Jennifer is a resident of Las Carolinas who still lives with a blue tarp covering her roof 14 months after Hurricane Maria. She lives with five family members in the basement of her home because the top floor is uninhabitable. She applied for FEMA's Individual Household Assistance Program, which covers repair costs to personal property and primary resident structural damage in spaces that FEMA designates as, quote, essential living areas. So these are kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, but it's, it's very interesting because uh, there's, they only want one designated space. So if, if it's a family of four and there's two bathrooms, they would only um, designate one bathroom as essential, not the other one. The latest data shows that FEMA denied 300,000 individual assistance applications and rejected or did not answer 79% of appeals. <clears throat> FEMA inspectors arrived five weeks after Maria and declared Jennifer's house a total loss. She had lived in her home for 44 years, but like many others in the community who live on parcelas, that have been divided over time and passed on through inheritance, she doesn't have a formal title, a formal title to her, pro to her property. In fact, as this slide shows, a 2011 FEMA confidential memo lists Las Carolinas as one of 116 sectors throughout Puerto Rico that FEMA identifies as a squatter community. The memo provides inspection guidelines and states that squatters, and presumably the entire community listed, are ineligible, ineligible for home repair assistance because, quote, they are not the owners of their damaged dwelling. And this is, um, 
this is a document I've acquired recently and I'm trying to follow up with it. It's, it's unclear if it's been updated and what this, what this new list might look like since 2011. After pressure from legal activist groups like Ayuda Legar, Huracan Maria, compelled FEMA to revise this policy of, uh, of accepting different forms of proof of occupancy and ownership. But this was only 10 months after Maria, so this was, for many, too little too late. People are now able to submit what's called a declarative statement to prove ownership with their FEMA appeals if, do they, if they do not have formal title. And this is an excerpt of the, the, the current declarative statement that people can submit. Because of her tenuous ownership status in the eyes of the state, Jennifer applied for FEMA individual assistance, supported by an affidavit from a pro bono lawyer, stating that she was the rightful owner and occupant of the home and in the process of securing her formal title. To her surprise, however, the Departamento of Vivienda finally began processing her application for formal title after Maria, even though she had been applying for title for decades. She expressed to me a sense of relief because she almost had her title as if this document might reduce her vulnerability to future storms. FEMA installed a blue tarp on Jennifer's home and authorized $11,000 to repair structural damage including an entire new roof in cement, doors and windows. However, Jennifer has not been able to find a contractor to do the job within this budget because she estimates that the $11,000 will only cover materials, wood, and some of the labor. She appealed the FEMA decision to try to get a larger amount but was denied and couldn't understand how what they said was total loss amounted to only $11,000. Quote, they came and took photos. They saw, she said. To fill the assistance gap, Jennifer needed to fully repair her home. The housing department recommended she apply for Tu Hogar Renace, a FEMA-funded program locally administered through the housing department that provides up to $20,000 for minor emergency repairs to make a house what they call safe and functional. Tu Hogar Renace is organized around seven construction conglomerates, and you can see the conglomerates here, five of which are U.S. companies, two of which are Puerto Rican companies. And they've basically divided the archipelago into contractor zones. Note that the Texas-based SLS company, shown here in orange for zone two, was just awarded a $145 million contract for Texas border wall construction, highlighting the deep entanglements between U.S. industries of disaster and security. These seven companies then con contract smaller construction companies in Puerto Rico to provide labor and materials, but the major profits are funneled to the top, to these seven companies. My interviews with Tuo Garanase inspectors have revealed the exploitative nature of inspection work, often paid per inspection, which incentivizes hasty jobs, and even how all construction materials that, the, that Tuo Garanase uses and appliances they install must be US made. So this program approved Jennifer for the maximum 200, sorry, 20,000 for interior repairs and installing appliances and electric generators. But Jennifer kept delaying the work because it made no sense to install interior equipment without a proper roof. Quote, I was waiting and waiting, time was passing and the roof was becoming more damaged. And every time Tuo Garanase wanted to come and install the equipment, I had to stop them because without a roof, everything inside the house would be damaged." End quote. The program told Jennifer to call once she had the roof done. Then around September of this year, one year after the storm, she called because she had gotten temporary zinc panels on part of the roof and figured that she could start installing the interior equipment little by little. But Chuo Garanase had closed her case without notification. Quote, time was up, they told her and that promised $20,000 vanished. Ironically, Tuo Garanase's website says, quote, the first step to your recuperation. I asked Jennifer if she was going to appeal the decision, which she has every right to do, but she said no because, quote, they don't answer the phones, there are always problems with the contact, and so here I am. 
end quote. After the slow violence of the bureaucratic marathon that seemed to work against her at every step of the way, she felt resigned. Jennifer's experience unsettles the normative temporality of disaster that moves linearly from response to recovery and rebuilding. Without a proper roof, what is called recovery seems stuck in time for her. Her case also highlights the disciplining role of, that property plays in dominant institutional disaster recovery frameworks or the tension between FEMA's reliance upon formal title versus people's lived experience and the reality of diverse property relations in Puerto Rico, and also a very ahistorical understanding of property. Um, discourses stigmatizing lack of formal property title come up repeatedly in my interviews with officials from agencies like FEMA and CORE 3. And CORE 3 is the central office for recovery, recuperation, and resiliency. Those are the three R's. Furthermore, in the draft central recuperation plan, central government recuperation plan, there's a proposed $800 million to promote title registration and establish penalties for those who do not register. And as um, these, these photos also give you an idea about what, like what the disaster subject, a, a, a proper disaster subject looks like for institutional agents of recovery. And this could be thought of someone who's a private property owning individual with formal title, home insurance, flood insurance, savings in the bank, and a 10 day supply of food and water. I'll briefly mention some methodological challenges conducting research with FEMA because it relates to access to information issues and recovery justice issues. And this is my experience as a white English dominant visiting researcher. In late May, I visited the Caguas Disaster Recuperation Center to inquire about municipality specific data because I could not find it online. And I don't know who has tried to look for FEMA data online, but it's, it's, notoriously, um, it's notoriously difficult, especially to find specific information. There were only about four residents in a large gymnasium that was the recuperation center, making their rounds through information tables. In fact, there were more armed guards in the gymnasium than Caguas residents, although it's unclear what the security threat was. The director couldn't give me any information, so he referred me to a contact from media relations. From there, I communicated via email and was vetted for over two months by both media relations and the news desk to schedule an interview for August with a high-ranking official. <clears throat> I was given a 15-minute time slot with this official and three of his staff members who sat in the room keeping time and also recording the interview I was recording. So I was, I was being recorded and I was also recording. I asked about FEMA's perspective on widespread application and appeal troubles and referring to FEMA's five to 10 year vision, he said, quote, we're trying to change the culture of waiting for the last minute. The people of Puerto Rico need to start thinking, quote, I need to take care of myself. I have to be responsible for my own future. I have to take action. I can't wait for stuff to be given to me. And I'm telling you because I'm Puerto Rican, it's cultural. They're waiting for stuff to happen. We need to change that to be proactive for your own future. If you're going to fix your house, don't do it halfway. Use the best materials, end quote. I thought of Jennifer, who had been taking action all along, and for all of those for whom recovery is nothing but a rhetoric. The FEMA strategic plan for the next four years echoes this same culturalist argument, promoting a neoliberal culture of preparedness, like the officer described and also is emphasized here in, in these, um, this slide. I'm gonna skip over a little bit, I'm running out of time. So, this is emphasizing things like positive behavioral change through trainings and exercises, increasing financial preparedness. These are the, the, the FEMA ideas about you know, disaster preparation and recovery. But there are also local alternative projects to reimagine disaster collectively, disaster recovery collectively, rather than through racist cultural deficiency frameworks and modes of indebting. And I'll close by just briefly highlighting the work of the Centro de Apoyo Mutuo in Las Carolinas, one of the many comms in the Red de Apoyo Mutuo, which please visit this page and, and check out all the projects, a project that Jennifer and other women residents of the community are leading. Um, they are transforming an abandoned school into a space of care work, healing, and learning, 
where they cook and deliver 100 lunches three times per week for elderly residents and caregivers. It's also a, a space to host acupuncture clinics, a thrift shop, and an activity room for elderly, elderly residents. And they're developing a community emergency plan to convert the school into a shelter and establish protocols much different than the ones of FEMA based on local needs. And I'll just, I'll close by saying that this particular project of Apoyo Mutuo and Mutual Aid in Las Carolinas demonstrates another path forward, albeit one constrained and shaped by relations of power that is framed around support and affective relationalities or a social ecology of support that refuses the individualizing frameworks where people are figured as consumers in a recovery market. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really happy and really honored to be here. Um, I'll be talking about Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and the internal state of reception as a legal framework for um, colonial theft. Um, and I'll be telling the story in a way that I will reflect over on, on my research, but still complicated to talk about Hurricane Maria and, and all the process that we live in the island and outside the island. So on October 17, 2017, 12 years after the economic and financial crisis began, and less than a month after Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico, Governor Riz uh, Ricardo Rosselló sent a bill to the Legislative Assembly entitled, entitled Bill to Create the New Government of Puerto Rico. This bill aimed to allow the governor to restructure the executive branch without consulting the legisla uh, legislative branch. The bill was intended as an emergency measure that would allow the governor to exercise his authority to deal with the economic crisis as well as with the aftermath of the hurricanes Irma and Maria. This delegation of power will last 10 years and it will be implemented not just to restructure the executive branch, but also to further externalize and privatize services traditionally provided by the local government. On December 2017, the bill become, it became the law 122. Simultaneously, Governor Rosselló issued two executive orders with the intention of creating the Central Recovery and Recon uh, Reconstruction Office of Puerto Rico. This new bill, was created under the guise of the state of emergency declared as a result of Hurricane Maria and was placed under the umbrella of the recently created Puerto Rican Public Private Partnership Agency. This new office will be in charge of administering emergency funds and recovery efforts, operating as an emergency manager and facilitating disaster capitalism as colonial theft. That is what precisely Mate calls emergency-based predatory capitalism. Law 122 and the, uh, Center for, uh, the, the, Center, the Central Recovery Office normalize and legalize the exceptional solution implemented by the local government to deal with crises such as a structural adjustment, budgetary co cuts, austerity measures, privatizations, and the crafting of an economic discourse that gives precedence to the payment of the debt before any other public aspect or any other aspect of the public life. In short, the violence of austerity and the normalization of social murder. The processes of defi uh, definition, the governmental structures, the, super, uh, the suspension of the rule of law, and the weakening of the internal democracy took place at the same time that the Puerto Rican were deprived of, 
uh, of the most basic services when the shock and the trauma generated by Hurricane Maria were still vivid and when the violence of austerity has been displacing people outside the, the archipelago. As Klein has pointed out, every emergency is the right time for government to exploit fear, disorientation, trauma, in order to enhance its power. Emergency situation and crisis thus provide the condition for the exploitation of fear as a political tool, resulting in the production of, a, of broken subjectivities, or what Agamben will call bare life. All the previous processes do not take place in a vacuum. In Puerto Rico, a double exceptionality operates a colonial state of exception which referred to the U.S. uses of this paradigm as colonial domination technique, exemplified by the control board, PROMESA, and the legal colonial constitution of Puerto Rico, and the internal state of exception in, sec in second place. We refer to the uses of this paradigm by the Puerto Rican government as dispositive to tackle economic crisis and natural disaster, exemplified by law, 122 and the Central Recovery Office. My research aims to speak the neoliberal rationality and the criminogenic dimension behind the uses of the state of exception to administer and tackle natural disaster and economic crisis that intertwine. My contention is that the state of exception has been used as the legal framework to ena that, uh, that enables corruption, state corporate crimes, and colonial theft as uh, disaster capitalism. My scholarship has been focused on reconceptualizing Agamben's uh, Agamben state of exception from a colonial Caribbean and global south perspective. My emphasis has been on the study of the Puerto Rican colonial history as a paradigmatic use of the state of exception as the legal constitution ontopolitical design and sociopolitical regulation of colonial territories. In so doing, I have developed the concept of colonial state of exception. Hence, the state of exception is the constitutive legal dispositive of colonialism. And therefore, my research has been, in first place, analyzing the, the uses of this colonial state of, of exception as a legal constitutional political um, definition of Puerto Rico the uses of colonial state of exception to legitimize U.S. colonial state terrorism, and in third place, the development of the internal state of exception by the local government, uh, the local government of Puerto Rico, and the configuration of the internal state of exception by the local government allow me to show that the uses of the exceptionality was also implemented in the management of the economic crisis. As a result, over the last two years, my scholarship has been focused on studying the intertwined relationship between the state of exception and the political economy. The first manifestation of this uh, connection is uh, the, the, that the colonial state of exception has been used to promote economic underdevelopment. I have noticed a twofold, a twofold trend. First, U.S. manufactured a colonial type tax having economy in Puerto Rico which provide for U.S. corporations and individual, uh, individuals to avoid taxation. Second, U.S. facilitate and even promote what I have called colonial state corporate crimes. Maybe the most important case of such practices is the deregulation of finance in the island since, 19, uh, since 1940s. That is, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission does not regulate the investment companies in Puerto Rico since, since then. Um, in second uh, the second manifestation of the state of exception and the political economy is the use of the internal state of exception to manage economic crisis by the local government. Since 2006, when Acevedo Vila declared the economic state of emergency given the lack of resources to pay the government, uh, government employees' payroll, Puerto Rico has li lived under a permanent economic state of exception. That is, all four administrations, Sin Acevedo Vila, Fortuño, Garcia Padilla, and Ricardo Rosillo, has been using economic, the, the economic state of emergency to administer the island polity and to manage the economic crisis. Consequently, Puerto Rico, 
politics has been depoliticized and repoliticized in terms of neoliberal economic rationality. As I have shown so far, it was precisely the natural uh, disaster definition of the uses of the state of exception that my, my research was lacking or that I have never considered as part of my scholarship. And then on September 20 and 21st, uh, 2017, Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico. On the morning of, of September 22, after hour, hours of cutting trees, cleaning the streets, and trying to make sense of everything that what happened, uh, what happening, the first news came from the only radio that we could hear in Maya West. Puerto Rico was under a state of emergency. A curfew was imposed, and the beginning of a new research agenda was emerging, one that would take me to research on the interconnection between exceptionality, natural disaster, corruption, and state corporate negligence. But above all, it would take me to think about how the violent conjunction between neoliberalism, austerity, and exceptionality produce and normalize bare life, abandonment, and social murder. Taking as background the traumatic experience of Hurricane Maria, um, I have noticed four resulting aspects from the management of the crisis and the hurricane. First, Austerity and fiscal stability policies imposed by the U.S. control board, uh, the U.S. by the control board and the Puerto Rican government to manage the so-called uh, 10 years crisis played a key role in undermining the capacity of the state to act and react to the devastation left by Maria. Second, uh, in second place, the uses of the state of exception as dispositive to deal with natural disaster intensify the disaster in itself. And thirdly, the failure of the private sector in providing the ba basic services or the normalization of, of state corporate crimes and negligence enhance the casualties and that of Puerto Ricans in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And fourthly, the normalization of death and corruption as mechanism of crisis management and disaster relief, particularly the case of law numbers two of January for 2018, which kind of tried to create um, uh, anti-corruption code, but always looking downward and, not, and never upward. To be sure, the crisis affecting Puerto Rico is not only the result of Hurricane Maria, but the direct result of neoliberalism and austerity. Hurricane Maria is the radicalization of, economic, of the economic crisis generated by colonial capitalism and the solution proposed by neoliberal rationality, solutions that have only worsened the living condition of Puerto Ricans. As a result, Puerto Rico is facing a, uh, facing a new dimension of the disaster capitalism, one that is based on bare life ontologies, abandonment, and the biopolitical exploitation of the trauma. Um, therefore, after 11 years of economic crisis and after the dismantlement of the social welfare state and its transformation into a corporate welfare state, Puerto Rico was unprepared to confront and resist two hurricanes in the span of one month. After destroying the social protection needed to resist any disaster, not just a hurricane, the local, go the local administra uh, administration resorted to the same old dispositive, uh, uh, the state of exception. This strategy worsened the crisis to the point that many scholars uh, have agreed that the hurricane left and also that a natural disaster that opened the door to, uh, for rapacious capitalism, corruption, and fraud. Let's consider this. As quickly as September 28, Rosselló issued order, uh, Executive Order 2017-53, in which he, uh, all rules and laws that regulate contracting by the government agencies were pulled in hold or suspended. This opened the door to, uh, to the contracting of corporations without the need of following the regulation of the Puerto Rico Comptroller Office or the Puerto Rican Office of, Ed, uh, of Go Government Ethics. 
And the clear example of, uh, this is a clear example of how the state of perception facilitate, uh, facilitated and lay, the, and lay the grounds for corruption, corruption, which was exemplified by the cases, the infamous cases of Whitefish, Cobra Energy uh, Corporations, but also in the U.S. we saw cases like um, with FEMA and the TARP scandal and the U.S. Army Corp and the Expert Corporation. But also not only the corporation, but the militarization of the island by member of the Army Reserve and the National Guard did not solve the problem of the shortage of, uh, shortage of full water electricity of telecommunic and telecommunication. We have to recall that uh, the first month after Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico was militarized. The crisis generated by Hurricane Maria proved the altered inefficacy of the state of exception as, political deal, uh, as, poli as policy to deal with crisis. This authoritarian and anti-democratic model, uh, uh, model has proved incapable of meeting the people's ne real needs. We show that contrary to the common sense generated by colonial neoliberalism, crises are not solved by imposing exceptional structure and the limitation of democracy, but by radicalizing democracy. In conclusion, bear life is not only the result of colonialism and exceptionality, but it's, the, it's also the, the result of more than a decade of austerity. Bear life is the living condition of Puerto Rican under the fiscal crisis and after Hurricane Maria, as well as Puerto Rican were and are abandoned by both the local and US government and uh, uh, local and U.S. government. The experience of Hurricane Maria shows, precise, uh, shows precisely that the neoliberal practice, that, uh, this neoliberal practice, that, that, sorry, the experience of Hurricane Maria shows precisely how these neoliberal practices are taking place. Just a week after the hurricane, the slogan was Puerto Rico se levanta. There were no effort to uh, rescue or save life, but on the contrary, the life, has, uh, uh, the people have to say that they save themselves. As a result, um, social murder, uh, murder is the result of the, of the destruction of social protection and regulations and the systematic corruption. But this positive dimension after this is that they are resistant. There are, so, uh, there, uh, there are so many movements in the island. There are, so, uh, there are everyday grassroots, community-based organizations such as Casa Pueblo, Mutual Aid, Project of Maria, and so many others that are resisting these criminal hygienic practices and are trying to create a fair, uh, uh, just and fair Puerto Rico. I have, uh, this paper aims to show the history of colonized power but never, uh, nevertheless, we have to remember that where there is power, there is resistance. Thank you so much. No, I don't have a PowerPoint because <laughs> I'm low tech, so, uh, so I'm just going to stay here and I feel like, uh, you know, so my work for folks who don't know me is on um, uh, policing and incarceration and so I feel like I'm in one of those dreams that you have where you're going to wake up suddenly in your underwear because <laughs> giving a talk in a courtroom has to be like one of those, <laughs> those moments. But um, so I'm going to share, sorry, so I'm going to share with you all um, today, you know, I want to thank uh, Monica, of course, for um, bringing us all together. It's really uh, amazing to to uh, have a chance to dialogue with you all and with some old conspirators and hopefully with some new ones. So I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm going to share with you all today an excerpt from um, that I've been thinking about and the, uh, I write about in the conclusion to my book, um, kind of reflecting, and I see a lot of uh, parallels with, with Jose's work around these questions of uh, uh, social death, as, as he termed it. So. Hurricane Maria has become a defining moment for Puerto Ricans in the archipelago and in the diaspora. From the thousands gone, to the months and months without electricity, to those forced to migrate to the continental U.S. in search of stability, the storm upended the lives of millions of Puerto Ricans in uh, ways that will reverberate for years. 
While Maria was and should be considered a sheer moment of trauma that affected the lives of almost every Puerto Rican, whether they were in Puerto Rico or, uh, or living abroad, we have to be careful of the ways in which such narratives of collective harm paper over deep inequalities that structured Puerto Rican society before the storm hit and have only intensified in its wake. In my talk today, I want to use my own experience and that of my family to unpack the ways in which life and death, resources and scarcity are distributed, or uh, resources and, and security, that should be, <laughs> sorry, are distributed unevenly among lines of race, class, gender, sexuality, citizenship status, and spatial location. While the storm seemed to bring people together in an attempt to rebuild and transform, it has also widened existing social gulfs and illuminated fractured communities. Then, drawing on uh, my research about punitive governance in Puerto Rico, I want to conclude by uh, discussing the ways in which the state is attempting to use policing as a mechanism to respond to the feelings of insecurity generated by the storm. While Puerto Rican activists on the ground, on the other hand, are working toward transforming Puerto Rican society through the principles of autogestion uh, or self-management uh, in an attempt to create a more just Puerto Rico for all Puerto Ricans. So I'm going to try not to get emotional as well, so I'm feeling Monica's uh, uh, comments earlier. But uh, on September 20th, uh, 2017, Hurricane Maria battered the archipelago in ways that no one was prepared for. Puerto Ricans had just dealt with the effects of Hurricane Ilma uh, only two weeks before, which had caused damage around the archipelago and hit vulnerable communities like the low-income, predominantly black uh, uh, pueblo of Loisa particularly hard. Everyone knew Maria was going to be different. It was going to be much worse. I spoke to my father before the storm to check in. I knew my family would weather the storm well. My family is middle class and lives in the town of San Sebastian in the western interior of the Big Island. They have a cement house, two portable generators, large tanks of water reserves, and money to stock up unnecessary supplies at the local Sam's Club or Walmart. My father is a roofing contractor, and he knew how to prepare the house for the storm. When we spoke the day before the storm was supposed to hit, he told me that my brother and sister and stepmother were all at home and ready. They would all hunker down together. I was relieved to hear this since my sister, at the time a student at UPR Aguadilla, lived in a small apartment in a flood zone close to the beach with three other young women. He told me he had checked on my grandmother and my grandfather in their homes and that they too were ready. My grandfather, a farmer for nearly his entire life, had taken some of his beloved animals into a small cement house to protect them during the storm. And my grandmother and her husband uh, had plenty of ice for their insulin. My dad told me that my stepmother, who worked for the power authority, said the storm was going to be really bad and that it would likely knock out electricity for a while. None of us had any idea just how long. Like millions of other people with familial ties to Puerto Rico, I watched with horror as the scope of the devastation revealed itself. The storm had knocked out communication, and I was unable to reach my family. I imagined the worst, even though I, even though I knew my family was economically privileged and therefore likely to be spared the deadly effects of the storm. For days, I called nonstop trying to reach my family members. My uncle, growing increasingly concerned and impatient with the situation, brought a plane ticket and traveled to Puerto Rico with cash and a satellite phone determined to verify their well-being, you know, ex-military, how they are. So, <laughs> so this was a privilege. This was a privilege afforded by my family's middle-class status. Ten days after the storm, I spoke to my father on my uncle's satellite phone as he choked back tears and told me everyone was okay. This was a privilege. This was a privilege afforded by my family's middle-class status. My family wouldn't have power and communication restored until a couple of weeks later, but nonetheless weathered the storm and its deadly effects well. Others were not so lucky. Life and death in Puerto Rico are unevenly distributed along lines of race, class, region, sexuality, gender, and citizenship status. Natural disasters, such as Hurricane Maria, function to bring the divisions to structure society into sharper relief. While my family was undoubtedly affected by Hurricane Maria, they were able to weather the storm well and return to normal faster in comparison to other Puerto Ricans, not only because of their geographic location, i.e. far from where Maria made landfall, but also because they were middle class, they were not undocumented, and they did not live in a racially marginalized community. Those Puerto Ricans who, unlike my family, could not afford to make up for the government's disinvestment in their communities and infrastructure were fully exposed to the deadly effects of the storm. 
Indeed, as we've seen from the mortality uh, studies conducted by Harvard and George Washington University, the deadliest outcomes from the storm were suffered by the, arch uh, suffered by the archipelago's elderly, rural, and low-income populations. If we think about the ways in which race, class, age, and spatial location intersect in contemporary Puerto Rico, then it becomes clear that those populations that are in the wake, to borrow from Christina Sharp, are living in the afterlife of plantation, slavery, and peonage, have historically been positioned as expendable, despite or perhaps because of their centrality to colonial capitalism and the project of Puerto Rican modernity. In the aftermath of the storm, recovery efforts have similarly been unevenly distributed along racial, economic, and spatial hierarchies already at work in Puerto Rico. It's no mistake that Trump visited Guaynabo, one of the whitest and most affluent areas of the Puerto Rican mainland, to show the, the world a great job that local and federal government uh, agencies were supposedly uh, doing with the recovery. Of course, the whiteness and class privilege of the Blanquitos assembled didn't stop Trump from blaming them from their, uh, for their circumstances or throwing paper towels at them like dogs being told to fetch. This was humiliating and painful, but Guaynabeños were among the least likely to experience the deadly outcomes of the storm. They might not have been able to escape the racism and colonial sub subjugation of, uh, or subjection of Trump's visit, but they were able to afford the racism and colonial subjection of having to reside in one of Puerto Rico's many sacrifice zones. The most vulnerable within Puerto Rican society bore the brunt of the storm's deadly uh, uh, effects, and now, afterwards, are essentially being told to brace for more and more austerity or get out. Indeed, La Junta, uh, the federal uh, uh, control board, the fiscal control board, has not slowed down its efforts to service Puerto Rico's debt in the face of disaster and humanitarian catastrophe. And the federal government is applying pressure to the fiscal control board to speed up asset recovery for Puerto Rico's creditors. Hurricane uh, Maria brought to light not only the hierarchies that exist within Puerto Rican society, but also the ways that colonial development schemes have consistently failed Puerto Ricans. Uh, colonialism is an inher inherently extractive enterprise. It steals the bodies and resources of the colonized. Hurricane Maria revealed what colonial development and its ideological apparatus attempts to mask, that the current political arrangement works to make it impossible for Puerto Ricans to dictate the terms of their own future. Colonialism attempts to steal the future of the colonized to make them believe that there is no other way. Following Hurricane Maria, it was clear that the federal government and Commonwealth government were set on rebuilding Puerto Rico or getting Puerto Rico back to a baseline normal that was needed for colonial capitalism to function efficiently while many people were increasingly asking what it would mean to transform Puerto Rico. Nothing demonstrates this juxtaposition more clearly than the Commonwealth government's attempts to revive zombie policies that didn't, refuse, uh, that didn't work but refused to die, such as broken windows policing in the aftermath of the storm versus the response of everyday Puerto Ricans to work towards new ways of living in Puerto Rico based on principles of solidarity and mutual aid. After the new year and about three months after Maria struck Puerto Rico, the U.S. Attorney in Puerto Rico, Secretary of uh, Puerto Rico Department of Public Safety, and Puerto Rico's uh, Secretary of Justice all held a press conference and announced that they would be implementing broken style uh, policing in response to a surge of murders uh, that happened after the storm. This news was already misleading as a position broken windows is something new to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's Secretary of Justice Juan de uh, Vasquez told those uh, gathered, quote, we're a nation of laws and uh, a nation of law and order, and that's the way we're going to behave, end quote. The officials said that they would be mobilizing local and federal resources to go after dr drivers with expired tags, illegally tinted windows, or the run red lights. The logic was that this, these, the same people who commit these traffic violations uh, were the same people that commit murders. Uh, despite the fact that uh, broken window, which like anyone who spent like more than like a day in Puerto Rico could tell you is like everyone, uh, you know, comienza la luz is like after midnight is like everyone does that, right? So, uh, so despite the fact that broken windows was not new and that it would be targeting what were widely tolerated illegalities, uh, law enforcement officials promised the public that this aggressive policing would work to alleviate feelings of insecurity that many felt following Maria. Uh, as I show in my book, and uh, spoiler alert, this is not true. So uh, here in the aftermath of the storm, we see the ways in which punitive governance deploys simplistic responses to complex social problems. It is true that Puerto Rico saw a spike in homicides following the storm, but broken windows targeting of low-level traffic violations would never come close to addressing their causes or reducing their occurrence. 
For instance, broken windows policing would not have stopped someone from getting killed in the process of trying to steal a neighbor's generator because they could not face another day without light. Broken windows would not have protected the women and children experiencing domestic violence who, following the storm, found themselves with few alternative housing options and stuck in volatile situations with the potential to turn deadly. Uh, and as we're seeing now in, in the past week for those who are following uh, the, the protests against femicide in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, broken windows doesn't address what caused some people to turn to robbery and theft in order to secure food and other basic necessities in the aftermath of the storm. Broken windows policing would not change the fact that the drug economy, just like every other business in Puerto Rico, was upended by the storm. Gangs fought to retain or expand territory, and addicted individuals encountered increasing difficulty in accessing criminalized drugs that they depend on, which undoubtedly contributed to increased rates of violence. And broken windows certainly wouldn't have decreased the alarmingly high number of Puerto Ricans killing themselves in the wake of the storm because a future in the archipelago seems utterly impossible for more and more people with fewer and fewer resources. In many ways, these are problems that the Commonwealth government is ill-equipped or unable to deal with because of the constraints of uh, colonial capitalism in Puerto Rico. They are also complex forms of violence that can't be dealt with by simply trying to arrest, detain, and incapacitate vulnerable and traumatized populations. But of course, that doesn't mean that the state won't try to do that. Dealing with these complex problems and preventing their harmful outcomes in the future means a fundamental transformation in the socio-political and economic system, one that political elites in Puerto Rico and the U.S. are unwilling to entertain. As a result, the local and federal governments have joined together to react as opposed to prevent violence by implementing punitive measures that are meant to communicate that something is being done, all while maintaining the existing social order based on extraction and exploitation of the land and people. The revival of useless political strategies like broken windows policing, in addition to the failure to provide Puerto Ricans with adequate and necessary disaster relief following Hurricane Maria, has reaffirmed for many that the state will not provide for them. After the storm, the notion that only the people will save the people gained traction and expanded on grassroots networks that were already created long before the storm to deal with the effects of the mounting debt crisis on the everyday lives of Puerto Ricans. The groups and collectivities the distributed necessities, cleared debris from the roads, set up drinking water oases, tarped roofs, and made sure that people had nutritious food to eat, saved lives, and ensured people's survival in those days and weeks immediately following the storm. Importantly, as the immediate effects of the storm have dissipated, uh, and as, as we heard in, in Sarah's uh, presentation, uh, these groups are, are working um, not to repair, tr not only to repair what Maria has ravaged, but also what Puerto Rico's prolonged fiscal crisis had already threatened. These survival programs work to model an alternative Puerto Rican society, one based on the principle of autogestion or self-management. Autogestion proceeds from the idea that communities themselves are best able to assess and address their own needs. In other words, if given the space and resources, um, communities can solve the issues that confront them through solidarity and mutual support. Dozens of centros de apoyo mutuo or mutual aid centers alongside more well-established organizations around the archipelago are engaged in revolutionary praxis aimed at responding to the crises provoked by colonialism while working with community members to cultivate empowerment and, sustainable, and a sustainable future for all Puerto Ricans. These groups subvert the circuits of colonial capitalism at work in Puerto Rico by promoting solidarity as the way forward. These groups draw on political traditions and ideolo ideologies ranging from anarchism to abolition to radical feminism, refusing to allow colonial capitalism to shape their vision of Puerto Rico's future. While the co uh, collision of colonial capitalism and environmental catastrophe has left the trail of physical destruction and psychic trauma in its wake that will likely impact Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans for years to come, there are some on the ground working towards a future grounded in notions of justice and freedom with the potential to dismantle the systems of inequality maintained by punitive governance. Thank you.
Thanks. Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monica Jimenez and all the people who put together this symposium. And thank you for the invitation. Um, it's always uh, nice to be here, be back in, in Austin again. Uh, to talk about how my academic work has disrupted after Hurricane Maria, I have to put the crisis in context before the crisis. The atmospheric phenomenon hit the archipelago and its state university in crisis. I will give my, you a brief account in first person about me before, during, and after Hurricane Maria. When I finished my doctorate here at the University of Texas at Austin in 2015, I decided to return to Puerto Rico. It was necessary to go home. Although I returned to my uh, people, my sea, my hot sun, my air, and my Puerto Rican diet, also I returned to a bankrupt country, bankrupt country. The fiscal crisis that affected the country affected the University of Puerto Rico and its contracting method. For example, after my return, I started with a part-time contract and after a year, in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of the School of Social Sciences, I was offered a full-time contract. Contrary to the U.S., where the lecturers are dedicated to teaching, in the uh, University of Puerto Rico, it is necessary to fulfill the responsibilities of teaching four or more courses per semester, service, and research. Each academic year, from August to May, I have a salary and a health insurance. During the summer, as my contract expires, I am unemployed, without medical coverage, and without access to the parking lot of professor and the library system. On April, on April 5, 2017, in a student assembly, a systematic strike was decreed at the University of Puerto Rico. The student repudiated the 5,000 million uh, a proposed cut to the public university system by the Fiscal Oversight Board approved by under the PROMESA law of the U.S. Congress. In the, in the Rio Piedras campus, classes were resumed on June 12. Already, I felt depressed by an unnatural disaster. The feeling of helplessness enveloped me. Several students did not return to my classroom. I felt that I was running out of university without the university of the people, without the university that prepared me to survive victorious in the doctorate process. I did what I could to retake the courses where I had left them two months, two months before, and I did not abandon my research uh, sub projects. After spending a summer in classrooms, the new semester began the first week of September. The same week, there was an academic break because Hurricane Irma was approaching. That September 6, 2017, although forecasts that were not the passage of Hurricane Category 5 was in imminent, I had recorded in memory. I live in San Juan on the 15th floor of a condominium. Although the hurricane was uh, diverted, the winds were defeating, and Puerto Rico remained in darkness for several weeks. Even so, on September 11, I was back in the classroom. Seven days later, Hurricane Maria threatened us. Again, I had to prepare for a hurricane. This time, I would not risk stay staying at home and decided to go to Fajardo with my family. On September 19, at 11.30 at night, the power went out. At that moment, the rain and wind began. The house seemed to move. The water passed through the doors and windows. They were 12 consecutive hours of rain and wind. At noon on Wednesday, September 20, I only saw devastation in my surroundings, a heartbreaking panorama. When I finally got out of Fajardo because they had enabled the passage, I arrived, I arrived at my house in San Juan. My apartment on the 15th floor was flooded and there were broken glasses in the living room. I had to clean, pick up a couple of pieces of clothing and return to Fajardo. The 45 minute route was extended by impassable roads. I arrived in Fajardo, violating their curfew. On October 5, uh, 5, 5 uh, from an area of San Juan, I sent a very brief email to my students. I hope you are well within the circumstances. Fuerza. In the article, More Than a Natural Disaster, Puerto Rico in the Aftermath of a History of a Storm, the Caribbean historian Blake Scott and I pointed out, September 20, 2017 is, not, is now part of the collective memory of the Puerto Rican people, both on and off the island. For 12 straight hours, each of the 78 municipalities that make up the archipelago endure catastrophic winds and relentless rain. Today we speak of a Puerto Rico before and after Hurricane Maria. 
despite all the warnings of potential disaster, there was no way to prepare in the short term for the beauty of a Category 4 hurricane with winds surpassing 550 miles per hour. Modern Puerto Rico was not built or maintained to withstand it. The storm's devastation exposed the entire community to the elements. The island's electrical, water, and telecommunication services had the hurricane chasing media reported collapsed. Maria revealed the fragility of Commonwealth government, laying bare its lacks of organization and resources. It also revived long-running debates about the status of the island. Is Puerto Rico a colony of the United States? Or are Puerto Rican really U.S. citizens will lower the rights that should entail? On October 8, 2017, I had the privilege of leaving the island to Houston, Texas. The airport was full. On my flight from San Juan to Dallas, where I made a stop, there were 22 people in wheelchairs. I arrived in Houston to connect to the internet to buy batteries and lamps by Amazon. To my father, I sent him a package by mail with the hope that it would arrive promptly. The box arrived in Fajardo almost a month later. While in Houston, I dedicated myself to completed FEMA application for members of my family and friends. Those days, I could read the emails and listen to the voice messages sent to me by family and friends outside of Puerto Rico. Even, I had the opportunity of returning to this campus to the Foro Urgente on Natural Disaster, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean after hurricanes Irma and Maria. Here, I thought of, of my 69 years old father, my 85 year old grandmother, the youngest of my family who was barely a month old when the hurricane attacked us, in my friends and in my more than 100 students. I already knew how to survive daily in Puerto Rico. That's why I was anguished to know what I was going to return and was going to find the same scenario I left behind. I had to return to the classroom on Monday, October 30th. On the plane, I lost consciousness. I, wake, I woke up dazed with the flight attendants placing a mask with oxygen, a paramedic saying that he did not feel my pulse, and Puerto Rican doctor interrogating me. I left the plane escorted. I went straight to the medical center of Rio Piedras. There, I suffered another episode of lot of consciousness. A couple of friends took me to the U.S. Comfort, which was anchored in Old uh, San Juan. On there, a tent full of people waiting to be seen, a soldier told me he did not know if there was a specialist in neurology. I had to wait my turn like the head of the patients, who had been there for many hours. I ended up in a private hospital. I had to warn my students that there would not be class the next day. I never knew clinically what happened to me. However, I can assure that my body was turned off and did as we said. I spent two weeks in Houston and a week in Charleston, South Carolina. I tried to recharge my batteries to return to the classroom and my batalles de bomba. In those three weeks, my sense of helplessness deepened. I felt vulnerable. Frustration dominated me. Courage stood hold of me. I thought of the images of Donald Trump throwing roll of Piper, the MRE food bags, the militarized country, the long lines, the Jones Act, the lack of water and power, the death. Anyone who knew that I'm Puerto Rican immediately asked if I had passed the hurricane on the island. They told me that they were very sorry for what we were going through, that the images were devastating. I was even receiving hugs from unknown people. They added, are you going back to Puerto Rico? Yes, I have to go back to the colony. Yes, I have to return to the university devastated since before the hurricane. They were those who asked me, Puerto Ricans want to be part of America? Well, Puerto Rico is part of America. Without a doubt, my self-identification and interpolation as a woman black Puerto Rican and the experiences lived in recent years have shaped my research interests. I started studying racialization in Puerto Rico through music with the analysis of popular songs and interviews with black Puerto Rican musicians. I continue working on racialization from the contemporary Puerto Rican bomba music and its intersection of race, nation, culture, class, and gender. Today, I continue to research Puerto Rican music as bomba and plena, but with a feminist intersectional approach of gender and race. I am observing Ausuba and Plena Combativa, groups of their uh, and, the uh, and the political feminist and the colonizing musical proposals. 14 months after Hurricane Maria, I reaffirmed the need to contribute to the discipline to, of anthropology in Puerto Rico, 
with academic works that may visible the most vulnerable people by state institutions. It is urgent to exhibit the real realities of Puerto Rican women. I continue to question how the discourses of negritude, blackness in Puerto Rico are constructed, how racialization operates on the island, and how the gender variable redraw the, this imaginary in a racist and cis-heteronormative country. I see feminist bomba and plena as a scenarios to unveil new forms of reappropriation and revolution. The bombeadoras and pleneras are doing music as a rebellious project against gender violence. They have found in bomba and plena spaces of female in, in, empowerment. Personal needs turn out to be the same at the collective level. A week ago, on November 23, in the Plantón Feminista contra la Violencia Machista, the pleneras and bombeadoras stayed present. The women of all ages played plena and danced bomba. Those hands that beat the tambourines or the drums and those dancing bodies seem to be in a cathartic trance. In the wake on blackness of being, Christina Charpy says, for if we are lucky, we live in the knowledge that the wake has positioned us as no citizen. If we are lucky, the knowledge of this positioning avail us particular ways of receiving, re-inhabiting, and reimagining the world. And we might use this of being in the wake in our responses to terror and the varied and various ways that our black lives are lived under occupation. I want in the wake to declare that we are black peoples in the wake with no state or nation to protect us, with no citizenship bound to be respected and to position us in the modalities of black life live in as under despite black death, to think and be act from there. It is my particular hope that the practice of the wake and wake work, the theory and performance of the wake and wake work as mode of attending to black life and black suffering are imagined and performed here with enough specificity to attend to the direness of multiple and overlapping present that we face. It is also my hope that the practice of the wake and wake work might have enough capaciousness to travel and to do work that I have not here been able to imagine or anticipate. Here is Ausuba and Plena Combativa. Before, during, and after Hurricane Maria, women have not stopped composing, playing, singing, and dancing in Puerto Rico nor have they stopped being victims of multiple forms of violence. I have not stopped thinking and stopped or stopped writing and denouncing. Little by little, I, become, I am becoming a sociocultural feminist activist and fugitive anthropologist. So the hurricane, without abandoning my central theme, racialization in Puerto Rico, has allowed me to sharpen the course of my academic work. The colonized female bodies follow in the wake giving battle and overcoming natural and unnatural hurricanes with the certainty that we will build another life. Thank you. So thank all of you. I just want to thank all of you for your comments and your papers. Um, I think I'm going to switch direction a little bit and, and forego uh, some of the comments I had, but I do want to raise the questions that I had that are related to your papers so that we can also get to the audience. So think about your questions and your comments um, as we have this discussion up here first. Um, so some of the things that your papers brought up for me, I have three questions, so I'm going to throw them all out, and then you can also, as part of your responses, also respond to each other, right? So some of the things that you heard that sparked something for you. So the first question is about the, the topic of this panel, and all of you have talked about your individual journeys around this, but are we talking about reorienting Puerto Rican scholarship, or are we really talking about, given the continuities and the intensifications that you all really point to, are we talking about taking the existing and current research and using it as a platform for action? Um, so what, is really, what are really the roles of, of academia and academics in the wake of the crisis right now? The second question is also, given the enormous challenges that you all point out, the neoliberal agenda, disaster capitalism, the colonial relationship. I'm sorry, I don't know why my phone loves to, it does this in class too. But anyway, <laughs> um, 
the states of exception, the failures of the recovery. Um, what do we do with the state, right, in this moment? When I say the state, I'm referring to the junta, the federal government, the Commonwealth state, right? Are we tabling it, seeding it, struggling with it, fighting with it, or some other alternative? What do we do with the state? The third question I had, all of you spoke about the creative, painstaking, life-giving work that's happening on the ground, right? Say more about something, say more about the most exciting possibilities you see for a Just Rebuild, and also connected to that, um, what are the opportunities for transforming the pre-existing inequalities that all of you pointed to? All right, I know that's a lot. So you don't have to answer all three, take the ones that move you and then also respond to each other. And I'll just say them really quickly, the role of academics, is it reorienting or taking the, um, using the research we have as a platform for action, given the challenges you point out, what do we do with the state? And what are some of the, the um, highlight one or two things happening on the ground that you're really excited about and, and the opportunities for transforming pre-existing inequalities? Um, I guess um, for the first question, uh, we can do all of the uh, proposals that you have reorienting and also rethink what we already have uh, been doing. And regarding the state and all the institutions, the Puerto Rico, the United States, and, and all the institutions, the Junta de Control Fiscal, um, I guess we, we need to continue um, exposing what are, they are doing, you know, in, in these panels, but also outside the, the academia. And for me, the, the most exciting thing that I, what I'm seeing uh, doing this work with AUSUBA, with Plena Combativa, is also that I'm doing applied anthropo anthropology. They are guiding me what I have to do, what I, they need to, 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 to expose, to, to what, what they are fighting for. And I guess this is the most important that my, uh, my research has been guided by them. Uh, not what I'm, I, I also, as a black Puerto Rican woman, have similar needs that they have. So that's also, um, is, is, is uh, doloroso, it's painful, mm -hmm. but also uh, it's exciting for me. So I think this question about the state is really important. I think it's something that at least in my work, I have been thinking a lot about because I, and, I, and I think it is something that is really crucial to parse out in the aftermath of, of, of this disaster because there's a tendency to talk about the state and to equate the state with the federal government, right? And I think that that is a really dangerous and erroneous uh, conflation of what we're talking about when we're talking about the state, right? So the idea that the Puerto Rican state is just kind of the lapdog of the federal government, right? And I think that that's a huge mistake, and I think it's a mistake for the reasons that I think many of my co-panelists pointed out, which is that local elites, right, who form the state, in Puerto, the local state in Puerto Rico, right, are, are, have been and currently are maneuvering in a variety of ways to achieve particular goals around extraction and capital, uh, capital uh, maximization and things like that, right, that far beyond, that far exceed the, 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 the kind of whims of the federal government, right? So I think that there needs to be an attention to the ways in which the, the, the local state, right, is not just uh, simply a lackey for colonialism, right, but they're enhancing and, and, and maneuvering in their own ways to maintain uh, um, kind of local inequalities that benefit them too, right? And so we have to think about the way in which there is an inequality that's operating at a variety of levels through the state, right? And to, to be really clear about what exactly we're talking about when we're talking about the state, right? And so that's something that, that I think is um, super, super important to, to, to parse out. The other thing just very quickly in terms of what I think is, is some of the exciting work that's happening, um, you know, I'm, I'm super inspired by, by the Centros de Apoyo Mutuo, um, by the Plantón that just happened, right, that, that you were discussing, but that those are initiatives that are deeply feminist initiatives, right? Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily getting spoken about as feminist initiatives, right? So I think that the way that Puerto Rican women are at the mm -hmm. forefront of many of these um, uh, survival strategies that have em emerged in long before the hurricane in response to crisis, right, I think begs questions about like what, 
I think it amplifies our understanding of what we think about as feminist organizing, right? And so what does it look like to do feminist organizing where it's a woman-led movement that is not always solely centered on what we would think of as traditional feminist uh, issues, right? But, but, but these kind of issues of debt as a feminist issue, right? Colonialism as a feminist issue, right? I think that that's really an exciting, it, it poses really exciting questions for us. Um, thank you. Thank you for the questions. I, I wanted to respond quickly to the, the question on the state, too. I, I'm really interested in this in, in my own research, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think about uh, municipalismo, uh, the use or the, the negotiation with the, the local municipal state. And in, in um, the case of, of Las Carolinas, it's very interesting because the residents association, which is directly tied to the um, office of autogestión comunitaria of the municipality of Caguas, has done incredible things since the hurricane and really kind of uh, it propelled a, 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 a very local agenda based on different negotiations with, with the municipality. So I'm, I'm really interested in this question, but I also am interested in how discourses of autogestión, for example, could be co-opted by state actors and, act, and actors of power, uh, agents of power. Um, and in how it, it could perhaps let them off the hook a, let, a little bit even more. So I think it's an interesting, yeah, it, it's a blurry and complicated area, the, the, the whole question about the gestion in terms of practice and discourse and the way it's, it's being enacted in different ways uh, in, in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and also about just the possibilities of recovery and transforming pre-existing inequalities, again, I'll, I'll speak about this, this case of Las Carolinas and the Centro de Apoyo Mutuo. It's very interesting because the, the lunch delivery program is not just about food. It's not just about um, delivering like, a hot meal three times a week to, to residents. It's, it's actually about people's presence and the, the, these kind of affective relationalities and the social ties that women are reconstructing in the, in the wake of abandonment of, of the what, what um, some women in, in the CAM have told me are, you know, otras Marias, the other Marias that happened before Maria. So I think that this is specifically getting at the pre-existing inequalities that this specific community is, um, has, has experienced, and it's, to me, very, uh, very inspiring. It's very inspiring. Well, thank you for that question. I would like to address the, the first and the second. Uh, especially because I, I think that our role is intertwined with how we imagine the state, and, but also it's a paradigmatic time because for a long time the left or those uh, uh, academic that are critical were trying to, to get rid of the state. And now, because of neoliberalism and because this rapacious capitalism, we have to think in, uh, in the state and we, have try, uh, we are trying to reimagine another state that is not, that is at least responsible with the, uh, with the people that it, it represents. So therefore, um, I think that after Maria, especially in Puerto Rico, I think we have the opportunity to, to point out mm -hmm. what is happening with the state, how the state, um, and our role as a, a scholar, uh, to point out, to hold accountable, and to show like, or to not show, but probably to give um, sense to what is happening with the state and how the state is abandoning their citizens, its citizens, and how the state is just, is acting. And I refer to the local state, to the Puerto Rican state. It's acting in a way that only, that we knew that, but now it's more evident, mm -hmm. that only is um, like, in the defense of the uh, U.S. transnational interests or the class or the, uh, the the financial sector and the banking sector, so that in one hand, but also pointing out that it was a criminal panic practice. It was a, a really um, a negligence, and it was really uh, fraudulent practices that we le left during the hurricane, and we have to hold accountable those who, uh, who represent the state. But after that, we cannot stay there. We have to reimagine and rethink possibilities of this situation. 
can be can we have another state can we have another way of organizing the common can we have another way of preventing disaster and preventing death i think this is the uh, this is the moment it's a unique moment for us i don't have the solution where we go but at least the idea that it will be nice to talk about <laughs> how, how we deal with this did, did any of you want to respond to each other's papers directly at all, or should I just open it to the audience? Okay, <laughs> all right. So I pass the baton to you all. Is there anybody who has any questions or comments? Please introduce yourself and briefly state your question or comment. <laughs> Go ahead.
you. There was a gentleman. I, okay. a program called LAMP, uh, Learning Activities for Mature Persons. And I had the pleasure of having Monica speak to us uh, with the intentions of making uh, certain questions uh, answered. Specifically, uh, the group that she spoke in front of, uh, approximately 160, 170 people, are my age or older. And uh, our typical Austinites, even though most of them have immigrated here in the last 10 years, and the questions that needed to be answered is, what is Puerto Rico? Who are the Puerto Ricans? As a practical matter, Americans don't know that Puerto Ricans are American citizens, don't know the long historical relationship that Americans brought about in relation to bringing the island and making it a colony. My question to you is, what's the strategy to make yourselves known to the rest of the country? And I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to have that or that you actually have been devoting time or energy to that. But someone, and I would suggest that that needs to be considered, needs to develop a strategy to make Puerto Ricans known as a group of people that are important to this country. Thank you. Maybe we can take one more question or comment and then have responsive. There's one over here. Um, thank you all for an unbelievably terrific panel. Um, I wanted to pick up on, on Sarah's story about the requirement now that people get titles to their land. And I think because each of you was showing sort of different forms of dispossession and some that were quite overt and I mean particularly, yeah, some that were quite overt and then some that were maybe less subtle. And so I just, I wanted to, I, I'm just kind of curious about whether you think the titles, part of the idea might be so that it becomes easier for the land to be purchased by folks who want to engage in certain forms of development that would end up displacing the people, the very people who've gotten the titles. Anyone? Um, thank you, thank you for the questions and comments. Um, yes, I think that's one huge factor. I, I definitely think that's part of the plan. Um, I am, I'm very interested in property relations my, my question, it's a big question, is why is it becoming a problem now uh, across the board for these relief agencies and a, a, a kind of new or re-emphasized sphere of intervention? And so with this money, 800, literally $800 million, and the, the problem is that the uh, Plan de Recuperación has no details about, about this. It's just like a very small section with this is the amount of money uh, will be used for promoting registration and penalizing those who don't register. Uh, we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, I've just last week I interviewed the housing sector lead of Core 3 who right this this proposal is under his sector and he could not tell me about what the plan was for this $800 million. So I'm um, Part of this is me also following themes that become that are really relevant for 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 research uh, for research participants, people, what they're dealing with in their daily lives. Obviously, property has has become a major issue. But part part of my question is exactly this: the, the relations of power that are involved with why it, why it's a sphere of intervention at this point, and how, in the long run, with the idea of recovery, that these property relations will be changed. And um, for many people I'm, I'm interviewing that don't have formal title, it's not, uh, they didn't really think that it was an issue before Maria, for example, before they were encountered with the fact that they couldn't get the housing assistance aid because they didn't have a formal property title. And this thing about, you know, after 10 months, 
allowing a declarative statement, which FEMA did not publicize, um, many people just didn't know that, that that became an option. So property is, I think, a really critical sphere for thinking about what recovery is going to look like down the road and who's going to be benefiting. Is it clear what the penalties are? No. The, well, the recuperation plan doesn't say that. And um, again, the person who is supposed to be in charge of this section of the plan could not give me information about it. So I, I, I don't know what, it, what the penalty, how will it be implemented? It seems like maybe something that the, the property registry is in the municipality level, uh, but I think it's something to keep in mind. You look like you wanted to say something. I'm like in class. Like this is like, you look like you had something on your mind. <laughs> well, no, it's, well, in the, in the book uh, Naomi Klein just published, um, The Battle for Paradise, she argues that this whole process of the, uh, or she presents all this process of the cryptocurrency and how they are trying to buy or try to settle there. Um, we also have seen a process of uh, spe uh, speculative or uh, speculation um, and, and and a lot of people are losing their houses, and there has been a serious process of uh, evictions and mm -hmm. and so forth, which in a way the next crisis it will be um, this whole stock of houses that the banks has. So that might open the door for a new dimension of um, of, of either the crisis or a speculative um, economic. But it's, it will be kind of conspiracy theory to kind of say what is going to happen. But yeah, we can see all this process of um, of um, on this, this possession and, and so forth, mm -hmm. which is is problematic. It's really problematic, especially the case of the people evictions and the whole process of of of, of people losing their their houses especially in the wake of the hurricane. So yeah, it's something to look closely, I will say. Uh, I'll just say um, just a quick thing. Um, I think in, you know this question of how to make Puerto Rico matter is obviously something I think a lot about, right? Because you know, just thinking about when I started my dissertation, uh, which I'm sure folks who uh, are studying in U.S. universities and work on Puerto Rico have heard similar things, which is like, how do you make Puerto Rico matter to someone who doesn't care about Puerto Rico, right? Which is like most people, right? So, um, so you know, I, I, th I think a lot about that question, but I think it's it's a it's a tricky question for a variety of reasons, right? And and I think this has to do with with kind of the question of how you know. I think one of the things that tied together some of the comments in the papers is this question of like, when does Puerto Rico become visible and how, right? And part of the issue and what I saw after Maria, which was really troubling for me, was that a lot of how Puerto Rico entered the mainstream U.S. discourse was like, Puerto Ricans are, are U.S. citizens. We can't treat citizens like this. It's horrible the citizens are going through this, right? And I think that we have to be really careful about that, right, because of the limitations of that, that suturing of rights to citizenship, right? So the idea that Puerto Ricans were not citizens, right, that who, who cares what, what happens to them, right? Or that um, they are somehow, um, it, is, it is more egregious that their human rights are being violated and that they're colonized people because they're citizens, right? So I think that we have to be really mindful of when it does enter the public sphere, right? And that was around particularly as it entered the public sphere uh, with like celebrities and mainstream um, media coverage and like relief fundraisers for the hurricane, it was all around like these are your, f it felt very 1950s, like get to know your fellow Americans, right, in Puerto Rico. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is a discourse that we, we've seen before, right, that, that you know, we have now uh, more than 100 years of experience in knowing that no one cares, that citizenship is not gonna save Puerto Ricans, no one cares, right? because it's a colonial and it's a, it's, it's a capitalist and it's a racial relation, right? So in the same way, the citizenship didn't save the people of Houston, it did not save the people of, of, of New Orleans when Katrina hit, it is not gonna save Puerto Ricans, right? So I think the question is how do we mobilize around 
these solidarities that are around this precarity and vulnerability that we have with other people, right? And hinging it on a citizenship is actually what precludes us from being able to do that, right? And so I, I don't have an answer. I'm on Twitter, right? So I try to talk to people on Twitter to let them know things about Puerto Rico. I try to teach my students about it. So I don't have a better answer for how to kind of promote it, but I, I do have a, I do want to say how not to promote it, right? And I think we have to be really careful with the language we use because we're actually shutting off all of these opportunities for solidarity with, uh, you know, and, and being in Texas, right? What are all the ways in which Puerto Ricans could be in much more solidarity with, uh, with, with Mexicans and Central Americans than we are, right? Or with black folks that we are, right? African Americans, right? And, and, and we're not taking advantage of that, so. So we'll go to Roger, and really back there, and then the, and Pavitra in the back. So we'll take three questions. This might be a little heady. I'm not trying to be, you know, smarty pants, but it, I feel like this is an opportunity. Um, and I want to like pull in, particularly the last comment that you made, Marisol, about this moment as an opportunity to possibly uh, imagine other possibilities, right? And so I can't, I can't help but think of Yanimar Bar, Bonilla's work in terms of non-sovereign futures, right. right? And I know this might sound crazy to folks that aren't familiar with it, but I can't help but think of the Maroons, mm -hmm. right? And sort of this, that sort of what's happened to Puerto Rico is Puerto Ricans have become marooned, right, by the hurricane. And there's a possibility of using Merunage, right, and the strategy of Maroons to like rebuild a sense of community, which you're getting at with the mutual aid societies, right? The way in which they're developing lunches, and then that's leading to them repurposing buildings, right? right? And so I can't help, so I wanna put that thinking along with something that Fred Moten says and Stefano Harney at the end of the undercommons, right? He said, they say that what you imagine, the future you imagine before the break is different than the future you imagine while you're in the break, right. i.e. when the storm and crisis is going on, which is a different future than one can imagine after the break. And we shouldn't imagine the future or a type of beyond until we're after the break. And there's a way in which I see Puerto Rico as after the break. So I see, so to me, my question is, you're post-break, right? What is the opportunity, right, in terms of thinking about governance or the, the, maybe not the need for a sort of state sovereignty, right? Are there ways of getting around these things and are people sort of imagining and how, how do we see them imagining now that could be actually very useful even 20 years from now in terms of imagining Puerto Ricans sort of taking care of themselves by themselves, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, I, other, I think other folks on this panel might be better at answering this than me, but I do think, you know, just in reference to your comment about maroonage, um, Hilda Jorens has been working around this topic a lot. She's, she's very interested in what are the ways in which a lot of the knowledge that was used and deployed after the hurricane was not, like the, the state doesn't exist for like rural poor black folks in Puerto Rico, right? The state has always been non-existent, right? So, so they were actually, even though the hardest hit, in many ways the most prepared, right? Because the state has always been an absent state for those folks, right? So I think this goes back to Nicole's really critical question about what is the state, right? And so, but I think the challenge, so, so just to say that Hilda Jorens has been really thinking about these questions, right, of resiliency, right? And what are the ways in which actually these folks who are descended from the kind of, you know, the, 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 the legacy, the wake, right? The legacies of, of, of uh, peonage and, and, and plantation slavery in Puerto Rico, right? Are really prepared for this, right? Or have less, we can look to that history for lessons for what comes after, right? Or how to organize society, right? And so I think that that's really, again, a crucial opportunity for solidarity, right? That also kind of emerges. But um, just to also say that I think the challenge with that is also this question of like, even though people are like, fuck the state, right? So that's like, that is the, the most, like people are like, we don't need it, it's not doing anything for us, it's just actually here to make our life a hundred times more difficult, right? They are, I think there's a danger to that, right? So they're imagining other ways of organizing society which is not tied to the, the rights that are given by the state, right? But then the danger becomes when the state is still that presence that can capture you, can kill you, can uh, ruin your life, right? Like what do you do? And I think that's the thing that 
people on the ground are trying to figure out, and I think that is the huge debate that's happened. We just were, a, a lot of us were just at the annual, or the biennial uh, Puerto Rican Studies Association meeting, and this was the huge debate at PRSA, which was like, what do we do with autogestion, right? It's beautiful, it's amazing, it's imagining new futures, right? And the state is still killing us, right? So I think that's the hard, the hard thing is like, how do you live beyond the state when you're still mm -hmm. in that structure, it, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I would like to add uh, that we are living like in two times or two, two temporalities. Um, in first place, we, we are still t trying to couple, uh, to, to understand what happened and, and trying to more everything that happened to us um, uh, 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 after Maria and there are people that are trying like to point it out and to deal with that. But at the same time, we're trying to create something new and that, that two processes are really difficult. Mm -hmm. And But also that recalls or that reminds us what happened after the hurricane that a week after Puerto Rico se levanta is the best example that you, mm -hmm. you no, Puerto Rico no se levanta. Let, give us a break, you know. Let, uh, let's let, leave us to think about this. And I think that is something important that uh, probably we haven't get there yet. We're still trying to understand what, what went wrong. Why so many people died? Why the state didn't have the, uh, why the state was unprepared to deal with this uh, situation? Who who or who was responsible for ma uh, so many people for so many deaths? So probably we have to address that first, and then after we heal that, probably we can reimagine. We, probably we can do the, the two things at the same time. But, but what it seems is like for some of us, it's really difficult to think about future when we still like like dealing with this sense of abandonment and this sense of, of, of what happened. What, I don't know, it's just kind of, kind of trying to make sense of these two temporalities that are really kind of, yeah. I, I I'm, it's difficult to make sense, I don't know. <laughs> They're like shocking or. Maybe we can do one more question. Okay, I'll try to be very quick. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Luis Rodriguez and I serve in the faculty in the Department of Population Health at the Dell Medical School, and I'm part of also the FEMA Organizing Committee for Planet Texas 2050. So I've been learning a lot about how do we think about disasters and apply the lessons here in Texas. So thank you so much for your thoughtful presentations. I'm, rem I'm reminded of Puerto Rico in 1898 when we were invaded, and you know there were also rep you know, people trying to kick out the Americans and then a Hurricane San Siriaco happened, and all of the public health strategies used to um, you know, feed people and heal and recover from disaster squashed all of the revolutionary efforts that were happening when we, at the, when we were at the cusp of independence from Spain. So I would love your thoughts on, on the, <laughs> the parallels between that squashing of, 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 of movement towards self-sufficiency and self-determination because I've noticed that there's a lot of um, ambivalence in the terms that you guys have used. You've talked about the, the dynamics of exception as like the people can man handle this so we need to take over versus the people need to take over and not wait to be helped. It's like, it's, you know, psychotic in a, in a little bit, right? So I would love your thoughts on that. How, and then how, um, food, music, irony, and humor are used as forms of resistance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just quickly answer a previous question? I mean, maybe we could think more about, about this question, that the question about, the, about non sovereign politics. Um, I, I, I really love your question, and I just wanted to highlight that I think uh, the movement for a citizen audit of the debt is precisely in this, we can think about it in this realm of non-sovereign politics, because for me, it's, 
uh, it's, it's using the very juridical language and the PROMESA bankruptcy process and like challenging PROMESA from with, within itself to push for a, a citizen audit of the debt because the official commission was dismantled by Rosselló first thing when he got into office. And, and also thinking through debt in terms of non-sovereign politics, historical debts. And Rocia Zambrana is a philosopher. She, she has a great article on historical debts in Puerto Rico. Her book is coming out next year. But the debt that, right, this, this practice of auditing and the, the politics of transparency is, I think, more about, for this movement, more about these very historical debts, social debts, um, than an actual number, you know, a $72 billion number. So I, I'm, I'm trying to think about the movement to audit the debt specifically in relation to, to the non-sovereign non -sovereign politics. I'm going to ask Bar 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 Barbara to say something and then we'll wrap up, if that's cool. Eh, esto lo voy a decir en español, así que me ayudan con la traducción. Eh, la pregunta del de caballero de LAMP. Eh, me quedé pensando sobre cuál es la, la estrategia. Usted nos pregunta cuál es la estrategia que tenemos para visibilizarnos. Y yo me pregunto cuál es la estrategia que tiene Estados Unidos para continuar invisibilizando, ¿no? Porque puertorriqueños y puertorriqueñas han estado en todas las disciplinas presentes. Hablemos de Arturo Alfonso Schomber, hablemos de Sonia Sotomayor, en los deportes Roberto Clemente. En todas las universidades de Estados Unidos hay personas puertorriqueñas. Aquí tenemos a Josiana, tenemos a Carlos Ramos, tenemos a la doctora Mónica Jiménez. Así que yo creo que estamos presentes. Entonces, eh, yo creo que es una... Y, y siempre con el orgullo de decir, I'm Puerto Rican. Así que yo pienso que la estrategia pues, también viene de, de Estados Unidos en continuar invisibilizándonos. Y la pregunta de, de Roger con respecto al, al cimarronaje, eh, me quedo pensando en cómo llegamos a, a pensar el presente si todavía no hemos resuelto el pasado. Porque muchas veces eh, cuando uno dice, por ejemplo, chistes que son degradantes o, o comentarios que son... Eh, degradantes en términos raciales, violencia racial, hostigamiento racial eh, y, y de género, mucha gente dice es que siempre se ha dicho así, es que siempre se ha hecho así. Y en la medida en que no repensemos nuestro pasado, no vamos a poder seguir pensando a, al futuro. Y la pregunta de, de eh, Laura Lourdes, <ríe> lo siento, <ríe> eh, me parece que Hemos demostrado aquí, ¿verdad?, con lo que las pocas formas en las que estamos mirando estos fenómenos, eh, que sí hay, hay un trabajo de base, que sí hay un trabajo eh, comunitario importante y que sigue creciendo. Y yo creo que es importante reconocer cómo ha, sido creciendo ese, cómo ha ido creciendo eh, toda esa gestión, particularmente de mujeres. Eh, y, y yo creo que todos tenemos la, la responsabilidad de, de, de enumerarlos y de unirnos a, a esos eh, procesos también. Así que yo creo que, que sí hay mucho que se está haciendo y falta mucho por hacer, pero yo creo que vamos por buen camino a pesar de todo lo que nos ha tocado vivir, natural y no natural. Gracias. That's what I think too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you for your wonderful questions and thank you to the panelists for your brilliance and I appreciate it.